Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, so let's jump right into some text, and then I'll wish you a happy Thanksgiving, all right? Uh, Philippians 4 and 4 uh, says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. Uh, we are in part two of this series I'm calling Rejoice, Rejoice. Uh, uh, part two, Paul's insights into joy. So, so happy Thanksgiving to everyone. I hope that you had a uh, happy and beautiful Thanksgiving. I'm praying. I know that some of our people are uh, going through some sickness and it's been very hard. I'm praying for you. Uh, I believe that God's going to heal you. I'm going to pray for you when we uh, have our prayer time in just a minute here. Uh, so, so I want you to be happy, all right? I, want, I, I hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. I, I want you to have a happy Christmas and a, and a happy New Year and a, and a happy 2022. Uh, and I want us to be happy because Jesus wants us to be happy. Uh, I want us to be happy because the Word of God tells us uh, uh, that the Word of God wants us to be happy. And I know what you might be thinking. I mean, I know we covered some of this. We're going to recover some ground uh, as we just get into this again uh, this weekend. Uh, you know, I'm talking about happiness. You might be uh, watching, thinking of that, that, you know, I, I mean joy, right? Uh, and no, I don't mean joy, okay? Uh, not, that the, uh, not that there's anything wrong with joy, uh, but... Uh, uh, I mean, what we're going to get into is that you know, I don't see any difference from God's word between joy and happiness uh, uh, as far as the Bible is concerned. Uh, now, I know that if you've been going to church for any amount of time, you may have picked up from some preachers or from other, some other church people uh, that, that, oh, you know, we're not uh, happy as Christians. We have joy. You know, I don't subscribe to that, uh, that idea just because... Uh, uh, because I don't see it in the Bible, uh, um, I, I understand, you know, the, the reasoning behind it, this idea that, uh, that as followers of Jesus, that, that we have something deeper and more meaningful. I, I agree with that, but you know, the word uh, happiness, joy, uh, as far as the Bible's concerned, those are interchangeable, right? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know why we do weird things sometimes as Christians, but sometimes we do. Uh, I'll talk to people and ask them, hey, uh, you know, or are you happy, brother? Are you happy, sister? Oh, uh, you know, I'm not happy, but, but I, I have joy, right? Uh, so I'm not sure why we do that, right? Uh, I mean, the, the church hasn't cornered a, the market on joy, right? People in the world have joy uh, and happiness, just like people in the church have joy uh, and happiness. Uh, uh, you know, when two unsaved people fall in love with one another and get married, I know I used these examples last Sunday, I'm going to use them again this weekend. Uh, when that happens there uh, on their wedding day and, and you may now kiss the bride, uh, they're full of joy, right, on their wedding day. Uh, when two non-Christian people get married uh, and they uh, get pregnant for the first time uh, and they go to the hospital and they deliver that little baby girl and the dad holds her in a, his arms for the first time, uh, he cries tears of joy just like us Christian parents uh, uh, cry tears of joy. Uh, and so, so we're talking about happiness, joy, uh, gladness, uh, jubilation, excitement. I mean, whatever synonym you want to use, uh, I believe that the, that the Bible teaches us and tells us uh, uh, that we're supposed to be happy. Uh, and I want us to be happy uh, because the Bible says that, right? Uh, uh, so rejoice, rejoice. We just celebrated Thanksgiving. Uh, in 27 days, uh, we're going to be celebrating Christmas, depending on when you watch this. Uh, uh, and, and then, of course, the week after Christmas, we have New Year's Eve and New Year's Day uh, and a brand new year. Uh, and so what I feel like God wanted us to do during this season on the calendar is for the next couple of weeks to just 
take a break from everything that we've got going on in life, uh, uh, the, the stress, uh, uh, the difficulties, the struggles. Uh, uh, let's just take a moment uh, uh, and and breathe in the, the grace of God, the goodness of God, and let's be happy in our salvation. Amen. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. 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 Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. I love it. Uh, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. Uh, the people walking in darkness have seen great light. Uh, on those living in the land uh, of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and you have increased their joy. That's what the word of God says to us. Uh, what, what God does through the coming of Jesus Christ, that he increases our joy. It says they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder, right? Philippians 4 and 4 is, is rejoice, rejoice, uh, uh, and a few other places in Philippians. Uh, uh, Isaiah 9 uh, and, and 3 is rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Uh, uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will uh, be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. It hasn't ended. Uh, right, what the Father started through the birth of Jesus Christ uh, almost 2,000 years ago hasn't come to an end yet, uh, uh, and it never will. It's an everlasting kingdom that will never stop. Uh, and because Jesus is seated on the throne at the right hand of the Father, praying and making intercession for us, uh, we can rejoice, rejoice. Amen. I think God wants us to be happy. Uh, I think God wants his people to have joy. Uh, and I'm, I'm preaching to myself. Uh, uh, I don't know how your Thanksgiving went, uh, but I'm definitely preaching to myself uh, uh, during this time. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read Philippians and just specifically went through it and looked for joy. If you haven't, I think that you should during this uh, series I, I commend that to you. Read the book of Philippians and just start looking at every uh, synonym for happiness and joy and the joy of the Lord and rejoicing. And I think what you find is going to be surprising. We have so much to be happy about. We have so much to be thankful for uh, and so much to be grateful for. And yet a lot of us church people, including myself, uh, a lot of times we just aren't very happy, right? Uh, uh, we, we justify our lack of joy by presenting our circumstances in life as evidence, right? Uh, we say, you know, uh, the reason I am unhappy is X, Y, Z, right? And, and uh, you can solve for X, Y, Z by inputting whatever reasons you feel like you have for being unhappy into that sentence, right? I'll give you some examples. Uh, I am unhappy because I am poor, right? That's X, Y, Z for some people. The reason that they're not happy is because they're poor. They don't have the things that their neighbors have. They don't have uh, the things that other Americans have. That's the reason they're unhappy. Uh, here's another one. I, I'm unhappy because uh, I'm sick. Uh, here's another one. I'm unhappy because of something that someone did to me. Uh, here's another one. I am unhappy because of something that someone did not do for me. Uh, we are unhappy uh, because life isn't the way we want it to be or the way that we think it should be. Now, here's what Paul said, Philippians chapter 1. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, uh, that what has happened to me uh, has actually served to advance the gospel. What's he talking about, right? Uh, we are unhappy because of things that happen to us that we feel like shouldn't have happened to us. And because they did, we're unhappy. Uh, Paul says, he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, uh, that what has happened to me has actually served 
to advance the gospel. What is it that has happened to him? Uh, was it something good? Uh, is he talking about something uh, like a birthday party or, or uh, a celebration? That's not what Paul's talking about, right? What Paul's talking about is being put in chains and being thrown in a Roman prison. What has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Uh, so Paul was in chains in prison and he wrote to us who are free uh, and he said something crazy uh, for someone in his position. What he said was rejoice, rejoice, right? That's what Paul said. So Paul was genuinely happy, uh, and we, uh, you know, in general, uh, you know, maybe you're a happy person. God bless you. Stretch out your hands. Pray for me. Pray for our congregation. Uh, uh, Paul was genuinely happy, and in general, a lot of us church people uh, are not happy. How does that work, right? Paul had his own X, Y, Z, just like we have. He had his reason. Uh, that he could have used to justify his unhappiness. Uh, uh, and that reason was a Roman prison cell, uh, arguably a more legitimate reason than most of us have, uh, you know, for our unhappiness in life, except for the thing that Paul didn't use it as an excuse. What was happening to him was not an excuse for him to be unhappy. Instead, in spite of what was happening to him, uh, Paul had joy anyways. Rejoice, rejoice. So what does Paul know that we don't know? That that's what we are. Uh, that's this weekend, right? Sorry, <laughs> look at my notes because uh, um, uh, Paul's insights into joy, right? It was I just couldn't grab that. Paul's insights into joy. What did Paul know that we don't know? What does Paul have that we don't have? Uh, what was Paul doing that we're not doing? How is it that Paul's in a Roman prison in chains and he is in there trying to cheer us up? Uh, Paul had nothing except for the joy of the Lord and we have everything except for the joy of the Lord. So the, the entire letter to the church in Philippi is just a happy, joy-filled letter. How is that, right? Uh, I, I want to, let's cover some of this language again. I know, you know, I'm, I'm recovering some ground, so forgive me. Uh, but, but let's look at some of these verses from Philippians uh, uh, and look at the language that Paul used as he wrote to us from prison. Uh, I'm glad and I rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Uh, a rejoice, rejoice statement. And he makes a, uh, one more besides Philippians 4 and 4. It's Philippians 2, uh, 17. I'm glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I think I just read that one. I think I skipped um, Philippians 1, 18. Because of this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. Uh, and, and just to so many more joyful statements in the entire book. Uh, chapter 1, verse 4, I always pray with joy. Uh, uh, verse 25, for your joy in the faith. Uh, chapter 2, verse 2, make my joy complete. Verse 19, that I also may be cheered. Uh, verse 28, that you may be glad. Verse 29, welcome him in the Lord with great joy. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1, my brothers and sisters rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 1, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Uh, and then chapter 4, verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Uh, Paul had a genuine, genuine, legitimate reason to not be happy, and yet Paul was happy anyways. Paul had reasons not to rejoice, uh, but he was going to rejoice, and not only was Paul going to just rejoice, he was going to rejoice always, and I say it again, rejoice. Uh, uh, and from chains in prison, Paul writes probably the single most happy and joyful book of the entire Bible. Uh, and so I want to make sure, uh, you know, that this, this comes across. I'm not saying that we don't have, you don't have a genuine, legitimate reason to not be happy. Many of us do, especially over these last couple of years. Uh, uh, some things have happened uh, in many of our lives uh, and we have a genuine reason to not be happy. What I'm asking us uh, 
during this season uh, of Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, celebrating the birth of Christ, uh, uh, coming into a brand new year, what, what I'm asking all of us uh, and, and what I feel like the Holy Spirit is challenging us with, uh, if you could be happy in spite of your reasons to not be happy, would you want to be? If you could have joy in spite of your sickness, would you want to be happy? If you could have joy in spite of your tragedy, would you want to be happy? If you could have joy in spite of your income level this Christmas, would you want to be happy? Uh, what was happening to Paul wasn't making him happy, but what was happening inside of Paul was making him happy. Uh, Paul's circumstances were not making him happy, but Paul's Savior, Jesus Christ in him, the hope of glory, that is where the joy came from for Paul, and that is where the joy will come from for us. Uh, so if that's possible for Paul, then that's possible for each of us. Uh, and so if it's possible to be happy and joyful in spite of what is happening around me, then I want to learn that uh, secret superpower that the Apostle Paul had, and I want to rejoice in the Lord always, and I say it again, rejoice. If you haven't turned this off yet, then you probably want the same thing. Let's pray about that idea, and let's pray for one another. Like I said, uh, we have a lot of folks that are, are sick in body and need healing. Let's pray. Father, I pray for all of our church family uh, and, and anyone that's watching, Lord, people battling COVID, people battling sickness, people battling cancer, uh, people that need healing in their bodies. Lord, you sent your word and you healed our disease. By your stripes, we are healed. I, I'm praying Lord, for our family of faith and everyone that's watching it, Lord, that your word, Lord, we have a covenant with you. Uh, it's a covenant of healing, I pray. Lord, you're, you said you're watching over your word to perform it. Uh, Lord, you sent your word to heal our disease. I just pray for our healing in Jesus' mighty name, Lord. I also pray for our happiness and joy. Uh, I don't think it's a light thing. I don't think it's a dismissible thing because you command us in your word to be happy. And so if you, if you tell us to be happy, Lord, we want to obey your word. Uh, certainly, Lord, it is what, yeah, I mean, it's what every American wants. Uh, it's what everyone, uh, what everyone wants. Lord, what we want is to be happy. Uh, and so we want to look at these insights from the Apostle Paul of uh, how he was able to rejoice in the Lord always uh, because we want to do the same thing. I pray for us that you would reveal that truth to us uh, and in us uh, so that we can grab hold of it and we can rejoice uh, uh, this season in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So number one, uh, one of the insights we find from our friend the Apostle Paul uh, is the work of the gospel brings joy. The work of the gospel. Do we want to know how to be happy? The work of the gospel brings joy. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, uh, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like my friend Timothy who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel, right? The work of the gospel brings joy. Uh, I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it necessary to send back to you uh, Epaphroditus, my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier, uh, who is also your messenger, uh, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Uh, uh, verse 28, therefore I am all the more eager to send him. So when you see him again, you may be glad uh, and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy. 
honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Okay, so verse 22, uh, one of the insights that Paul has into to this thing called joy and happiness, the secret to rejoice always, uh, he says there is this thing we call the work of the gospel. So there is work to be done. Uh, and I know that, you know, that uh, we, <laughs> uh, we grew up in the grace generation, and, and grace is a wonderful and beautiful thing. And uh, here's one of the struggles we have when any anytime anyone talks about work in the church, uh, the first place people go in their heart, in their minds, uh, is they say, well, "But we're not saved by works; we're saved by grace." Uh, and so that is true. We are not saved by work, uh, and we are saved by grace. Uh, but here's something else that is also true. Uh, there is work that is that has to be done, even though that work won't save us. It still has to be done, right? Uh, there is this thing that Paul called the work of the gospel. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is uh, you read about everyone uh, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Acts, and, and uh, all throughout the New Testament, everyone that served Jesus, they all worked extremely hard, right? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Jesus worked nonstop for, uh, during his time of doing ministry here on the earth. Uh, Peter, who followed Jesus, uh, uh, and all of the apostles, uh, they worked. They did the work of the gospel. Uh, Paul, the apostle, he, he worked, right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, this is what Paul says. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? Uh, he says, I'm out of my mind to talk like this. He, he says, I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. And he goes on and he goes through. But, but he says, I have worked harder than everyone. Uh, th there's work that has to be done. Uh, and, and here's the thing about the work of the gospel. The work of the gospel isn't a drag, it's a joy. Uh, doing the work of the kingdom of God brings the joy of the Lord to our hearts and to our lives. Why is the church so unhappy? One of the reasons the church in America lacks joy uh, is because we have believed our cultural perception of work and recreation more than we have believed what the Bible says about doing the work of the gospel. Uh, what is our cultural perception of work in America, right? Work is literally a four-letter word, uh, but, but we've turned it also into a four-letter word. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, the word work has become a cuss word in our culture. Uh, we, uh, as Americans, we are living for the weekend. Uh, we are living for our days off. Uh, uh, we are living for that big vacation that we've got planned. Uh, and we feel like every last moment that we're not working, uh, that we deserve to take that as leisure time, to have our time off. And so we spend all of our time restlessly resting, trying to fill ourselves with emptiness. It's hard to get full on things that are empty. And people don't want to do the work of the ministry because they, they want to try instead to use that time to make themselves happy but the problem is that uh, it's doing the work of the ministry that brings joy to our lives. Right? I mean, some of my happiest memories, uh, some of the happiest seasons of my life as a follower of Jesus were also the busiest seasons of my life. 
doing the work of the ministry with my father-in-law, Pastor Phil Miller. I mean, that man always was busy doing the work of the kingdom of God. I, he was, he was uh, taking me to the rescue mission, taking me to missions ministry, taking me to do outreach ministry at the Oval. He was, uh, we had fire on the street ministry in Goshen. We had prison ministry out of Bob Wiley. Uh, we were visiting the youth authority, uh, doing a rest home ministry. I mean, there, it was just a never ending supply of doing the work of the gospel. And those were happy times. And then here, let, let's talk about this other aspect uh, about doing the work of the gospel, that this, this insight that Paul has. Uh, uh, working with doing the work of the gospel brings joy uh, and doing the work of the gospel with other people brings joy. Uh, look at what he says. Paul says, Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he served with me in the work of the gospel, right? It wasn't just Paul. Paul wasn't an island unto himself. He, he wasn't trying to do everything on his own. Paul had Timothy. Uh, and and it was, he said, it's like a father and son. Uh, we're doing the work of the gospel together. Uh, he didn't just have Timothy. He had Epaphroditus, right? Uh, sorry, Epaphroditus. <laughs> However you want to say it. I don't know how you say it. Uh, he, he says, Epaphroditus, my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier, right? Uh, uh, we weren't meant, we are not meant to do this work of the gospel alone. Uh, one of the reasons uh, uh, that we lack joy is we lack relationship in the church. Not only are we not doing the work of the gospel, uh, but, but we're trying to get through it all by ourselves. Uh, we, that's not the way God intended it to work. Uh, we, we need one another, right? We're the body of Christ. We're brothers and sisters, uh, part of the same family. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 tells us that two are better than one. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, uh, one can help the other one up, right? If you're if you're by yourself and you fall down, there's no one there to help you up. Uh, uh, <laughs> man, does that that should resonate to the church? Uh, if we're by ourselves and we fall down, there's no one there to help us up. But if we're with someone, they can help us up. Uh, he says, "Pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up." Uh, also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And then he says this, a, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Right? So a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Why are we so quickly broken in the church? We're, we are quickly broken because we're trying to do this all by ourselves. Because alone, uh, alone, I, I'm just one strand, right? When you're alone, you're only one strand. Uh, and we're not supposed to be one strand. Uh, it's not me versus the world, right? Uh, it's not you versus the rest of the world. Uh, uh, we're not one strand, and we're not even supposed to be two strands. Uh, uh, we're not just two strands. It's not, just, it's not me and you, uh, and it's not just you and me. Uh, we're uh, members of a body, right? Uh, the, the, the hand doesn't just need the arm. It's not just the hand and the arm, right? Uh, uh, and, and the foot doesn't just need the leg. It, it's not just uh, the foot and the leg. Uh, the hand and the arm need the head, right? The foot and the leg need the head. Uh, it's me and you, members of, of a body, uh, and we're members of the body, and the body needs the head, and the head is Jesus, right? Uh, uh, the three 
fold the three-stranded cord is me, you, and Jesus. We need one another. Uh, the work of the gospel brings joy uh, and, and working together, working with our brothers and sisters uh, and working with our brothers and sisters and working with the Lord. Okay, so <laughs> part number two, uh, Paul's insights into joy. Uh, if you want to be happy, stop grumbling. If you want to be happy, then stop grumbling. Philippians chapter 2, do everything without grumbling and arguing. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. He says, uh, that's what he says, right? We, we want to be happy all the time. That, I mean, that's what everyone wants. So, so we want to be happy all the time. Uh, but what is it that a lot of us are doing all the time? <laughs> we want to be happy all the time, except that we're grumbling and arguing and complaining all the time. And, and you know, I always make this disclaimer, or I try to at least, uh, uh, that normally when I'm preaching, I'm preaching a sermon uh, that I definitely need to hear. And so I'm going to go ahead and make that disclaimer that uh, when I'm talking about uh, if I want to be joy joyful, then stop grumbling. That's me, okay? Uh, I grumble a lot. And uh, I think if we'd be honest with one another, uh, we would confess that church people grumble a lot. Uh, uh, and, and there's a reason for that. And in general, okay, a lot of generalization going on here. Uh, in general, Americans are grumblers. Uh, we are grumblers. We, we're spoiled. Uh, I mean, I was just thinking about, you know, this whole idea of the drive through right? I mean, if you're going to make hamburgers at home, you know, you're going to make a cheeseburger at home, it's going to take you at least 30 minutes uh, uh, to make cheeseburgers, right? And, and that's not even counting the time it took you to, to go down to Save Mart uh, and buy all the groceries and get home and, and start the barbecue. I mean, if you're just going to make a cheeseburger, it's going to take you uh, 20 or 30 minutes at home, right? But, but the, you drive your car into the McDonald's drive through and if you have to wait there for, uh, you know, two minutes, then you're going to lose your cool, right? Uh, you're going to start grumbling and complaining that the drive through isn't moving fast enough. Now, the, the, the children of Israel, they also struggled with grumbling and complaining and arguing. Uh, you know, I used to read about the children of Israel and how they were slaves in Egypt uh, and then how God brought them out of slavery and into the promised land and about how the whole time they complained the, the, the entire way uh, for all of the years that God uh, you know, was bringing them from Egypt to the promised land. The entire time they were uh, murmuring and complaining and grumbling. And I used to read that as a young, you know, brand new Christian and think to myself, how could these people uh, be so ungrateful? And here it is now, 30 years later, uh, I've been serving God since I was 19 years old and I'm 48 years old, so almost 30 years. Uh, and now I know uh, that, that we're all just like they were, right? Uh, uh, here's what Numbers chapter 11 says. Okay, and again, the, the, these people, well, let me read it to you. Numbers chapter 11. Now Israel, the people, complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. They complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. Uh, and when he heard them complaining, he was angry. The people cried out to Moses. They prayed to the Lord. Uh, so the, the place was called Terabah. Uh, and it says... Uh, Verse 4, the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. And now listen to what they said. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost. Uh, also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlics. But now we have lost our appetite 
We never see anything except this manna. That's what they said. They com So here's, here's what that passage tells us. Uh, 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 they complained and the Lord heard it. The Lord hears us when we're complaining against him. And I know what you're thinking because, you know, sometimes I think the same thing. Well, I'm not complaining against him. Uh, I'm not complaining to him or complaining about him. Uh, no, instead, we're just complaining about the life that he gave us. And that, that, that's the exact same thing. I, you know, we try to excuse ourselves by saying, uh, I'm not complaining to God. I'm not complaining about God. No, instead, we're just complaining about the life that God gave us to live. Uh, Romans chapter 9. Who are you, O human being, to talk back to God? Shall the thing that is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Doesn't the potter have the right to make it out of the same lump of clay, some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Uh, that's what we do, right? We, we say we, we, that we're not complaining. God. Why did you make me like this? Why is my life like this, God? That, that's what Israel did. Uh, if we want joy, then we've got to stop grumbling and complaining and arguing. Uh, here's what Israel said. They said, they said the craziest thing, uh, we remember the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost. Uh, at no cost. They were slaves for 400 years. The, the, the pyramids of Egypt were built on the backs of the Hebrew people, and now they are crying and complaining and grumbling to God. They remember uh, all the good stuff that they had in Egypt that didn't cost them anything. They were slaves in Egypt. It is, it is crazy to me how we misremember and romanticize our slavery in Egypt, right? Uh, we look back to the time that we were lost in the world without Christ, and some of us uh, feel like we had it better back then than we do right now. And the result of that is verse 6. Now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything just this manna, and we're so tired of this manna, we want, we want meat. Here's what happened. They, they lost their appetite for what God wanted them to feed on. Uh, they lost their appetite for the food of heaven. Uh, they lost their appetite for the food God gave them. And instead, what happened was their appetite uh, uh, was rekindled for the food they had in Egypt. They were literally, God was literally sending down food from heaven for them to eat, uh, but they had no more appetite for the things of God, the food of God. Instead, their appetite was rekindled, and they were hungry for the things of Egypt. That's what grumbling has done to the church. Uh, uh, that is one of the reasons that we have a drought uh, or a famine for joy and happiness in the church uh, uh, because we've lost our appetite uh, for the things of the Spirit uh, uh, and we are growing our appetite for the things of this world. If we want to be happy, uh, we've got to stop grumbling and we've got to start being grateful worshipers. Uh, it is impossible to be a happy, joy-filled grumbler. James chapter 3, Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grape vine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. You can't be a happy, 
joy-filled grumbler. You got to stop grumbling and you got to start worshiping. Uh, when we stop grumbling and we start worshiping, the joy will flow from heaven like a river and it will fill and flood our souls. Uh, number three, the, the insights into joy from the Apostle Paul. Number three, our last one. Uh, joy comes from having the mindset of Jesus. Um, joy comes from having the mindset of Jesus. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Have the same mindset as Jesus. Uh, one of Paul's insights into the secret uh, of being happy and having the joy of the Lord uh, is having the same mindset as Jesus Christ. And, and, and because uh, my sermon got longer, faster than I thought it would when I was working on it, uh, we're just going to have to sum this one up. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's a pretty simple concept. Uh, uh, you know, um, if we want to be happy, our minds have to be transformed uh, so that we no longer have an earthly mindset, uh, but we have a heavenly mindset. Uh, uh, we have to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Uh, uh, how does that happen? A couple ways. That happens a couple of ways. All right, one of those ways is definitely the grace of God. Uh, you know, we're talking about having the mindset of Jesus, and there's a couple ways that happens. One of them is definitely because of God's grace, because of God's goodness, because of God's love for us, uh, God helps us with that. There's a part of that that we don't earn on our own. There's a part of that that we don't make happen on our own. Now, we're, we are going to look uh, at that other part, uh, you know, that, that there is uh, our, our, our responsibility in obtaining the mindset of Christ. But I, but I definitely want to acknowledge from the Scriptures that part of this having the mindset of Jesus is something that God does for us in our salvation. He helps us with it by his grace. And let me read that to you. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. You can have the mindset of Christ. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we listen to the enemy and we believe his lie uh, that we can't be like Jesus, that, that we can't you know, think like Jesus, that our minds can't be changed and transformed, that, you know, uh, that we've always been the way that we are and nothing's going to change that. That's not what the Word of God says. That's not what the Bible teaches us. Uh, the Bible teaches that I can have the mindset of Jesus, uh, uh, that God has freely given it to me, right? That, that I don't earn it, that it, by His grace, in his salvation, he saved me, and in his saving of me, uh, he comes into me by his spirit, and then by his spirit, he changes and transforms my mind and the way I think. 
right? So that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned through the Spirit. Uh, but the person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things. Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That's what the Bible says. Can I have the mindset that Jesus has? I can because the Word of God says that I can and that I'm supposed to. Uh, we have the mind of Christ, okay? Uh, and that is by His grace and His mercy in our salvation. That's something God does in us and for us. That's one part of it. To, but let's talk about this other part of it, this part uh, of us participating in God's grace, of us partnering in God's grace so that we can reach out for and obtain that mindset uh, that we want to have. And that's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, and, and he starts that by saying... Um, you offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your true and proper worship. Right? So, so Corinthians, uh, uh, God's grace uh, helping us, bringing to us, working in us uh, uh, a new mindset that we have the mind of Christ. But Romans chapter 12, uh, uh, we find that, that we, I have to offer myself, I have to, I bring myself in surrender to the foot of the cross. I bring myself in surrender uh, to, to the throne room of heaven. I bring myself in surrender uh, to my Bible and open the word of God where I find Jesus. Uh, and in that my mind is washed and renewed. Uh, if I want the mindset of Christ, uh, part of it is partnering with the grace of God and the work he's doing in me. Uh, that I can't earn on my own. Uh, and then part of it is me, you know, partnering with God's grace and, and doing what it is I can do. All right. I can turn off the TV and, and I can open my Bible. Uh, I, I can uh, turn my phone off and put it away and I can get into my prayer closet. Uh, I, I could uh, take some of that leisure time I set aside on a Saturday to, to do all the things that I think will make me happy. Uh, and instead, I can do the work of the ministry where I find true joy, right? If we want to, to be happy and experience joy, then we've got to change our minds so that we no longer think the way we thought when we were in the world, when we were slaves in Egypt, uh, uh, and our minds have to be renewed so that we have the mindset of Jesus. If we think the way the devil thinks, we're not going to have the joy of Jesus. If we think the way the world thinks, uh, we're not going to have the joy of Jesus. Uh, uh, if we want to have joy like Jesus, then we need to have a mind like Jesus. Uh, uh, and the Spirit and the Word will help us with that. Uh, uh, and I think that we want that. Uh, uh, and let's pray together about uh, God's Word. And let's pray that we would find uh, joy and we would rejoice, rejoice uh, this holiday season. Amen. Let's pray together. Let me pray for you and you pray for me. Father, I thank you for everyone uh, that is watching. I pray for us. 
Lord, I know for many of us it has been a difficult season. We're going through some tough times. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, uh, you brought this word about, you brought this Philippians 4 and 4. Lord, you put it on me, uh, my heart and mind, before any of this stuff uh, broke out in our congregation. Uh, and, and I can only think and, and pray that it was because you know we would need your help during this time. Uh, that, that as we're going through some tough stuff and facing uh, some difficult things, that you want us to find joy in you, that you want us to rejoice in the God of our salvation, that you want us to draw up from the wells of salvation the joy of the Lord. And I pray that, Lord. I pray that for myself and I pray that for all my friends and family that are watching Lord, help us to be happy in your grace. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for watching with me this weekend. Uh, I'll see you next weekend. Amen.